Hey, so when I say the word family, what comes to mind? Think about that immediately. You probably think of people, right? Whether it's your immediate family, maybe extended family, maybe for some of us it's family members who have, have passed away. But here's the thing. Every one of us, when I say family and you think of family, we all think of something different. Because we all have different family members or even there, if you're from the same family, you have a different take, you have a different perspective, different position or role in the family. We all have different ideas about the family, right? And even from culture to culture or era to era, families have changed. How about this? In your own life, if you haven't lived long enough, you need to know this. Your own family is going to change. Let me those who will come and go and relationships that change. When we think of family, a lot of us rejoice and celebrate and praise God. Some of us, all of us, to varying degrees, have been hurt by our family members and different ones. Because we're not perfect children, parents, siblings, ourselves. And today we're going to look at uh, the fact that Jesus invites us into a better family. You can go ahead and turn to Hebrews chapter 2. That's where we'll be. Uh, and as I set this up last week... Uh, if you're with us, we're in chapter 1, and as Keith noted, I hope that you're all reading along with us. What a joy it is as a church family to, yes, come together on Sunday mornings, but to be reading through the Word of God together and, and hearing the Word, and we're, in the, and we're in Exodus because it's so tied to Hebrews. It's going to help us as we move throughout the entire summer. So this idea of family, though, um, it's complex and, and confusing. Jesus invites us into his family. In chapter 1, uh, to place this in context, the, the writer has gone to great lengths to show us that Jesus is better. But what, what one uh, theologian says, that first few verses in particular of chapter 1 of Hebrews is nosebleed theology. It's high elevation Christology. Jesus is the exact representation of God. And he goes to great lengths to show us that he's better than any prophet who's come along. He's better than any religious leader that's come down the pike or will ever come down the pike. Because he's not a religious leader. He instead is God. He's the exact image of God. We've said it this way. If you seek to live biblically, we hear a lot of people, you know, the Bible says. We say it here. The Bible says. Well, if our theology doesn't match up with the person of Jesus then we're doing it wrong. Because Jesus is perfect theology. God embodied. And so there's, there's never to be a leap between what we think the Bible says and then we go off and live lives that don't look like Jesus at all. And that's a problem for a watching world. And the writer of Hebrews then makes these citations, we call them, or our footnotes there, where he says Jesus is better than angels. Now, you probably don't approach this text or even today going, I wonder if Jesus is better than angels. You know, what is that about? Well, there was an obsession with angels at the time. An angel is a messenger. And, and again, Jesus is a better messenger because he is the message. And so he's, he's the better one. And then at the beginning of chapter 2, and I hope you have your Bible there in front of you. I know we show you the scriptures on the, on the screen or lower thirds online, but you need to have the Bible open because in the first uh, verse of chapter 2, he says, we need to pay close attention to, we've noted that Greek word there, the, the, the construction is furiously obsessed with Jesus. Furiously obsessed with what I have been saying. We see the first, therefore, all that we've said before, let's be furiously obsessed with who Jesus is. That's the key to the Christian life. Always back to him. N.T. Wright, one of my favorite theologians, he, he asked this question. Listen to this. How can you live with the terrifying thought that the hurricane has become human? That the fire has become flesh? That life itself came to life and walked in our midst? Christianity is, it, it either means that or it means nothing at all. It is either the more devastating disclosure of the deepest reality in the world, or it's a sham, it's nonsense, a bit of deceitful play acting. He goes on, most of us unable to cope with the saying, with, the, with this saying, either, either of those things. 
condemn ourselves to live in the shallow world in between. In other words, and I think the writer of Hebrews would say, that, that's what I'm saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. Or better, N.T. Wright is saying, this is what the Hebrew writer is saying. He's saying, if all of this is true, how could we relegate such a Savior to become our personal assistant? Our, our kind of spiritual concierge. Like to come to Him when we need something, Give him a nod on Sunday and then live as if he's not Lord of all. There's only one normal way to live the Christian life. It's all in. It's all out. And, and, and the Lord calls us to that. When we are furiously obsessed, when we see him, when we fixate on him, is what the writer will tell us. When we fixate on him, we see for who he is. And that demands everything. That we have. That's why every time we gather, that's our great hope that you would see him. I say it this way, stop trying to just be like him. Behold him. Then we will worship him. And all that the writer says, it sounds exclusive, doesn't it? Because it is. And especially in a culture that says there is no truth. Right? We've noted. If you say that all truth is subjective, yours up against mine. I have my truth, you have your truth. Let's just all get along. Don't make any major truth claims because that's exclusive. But watch this. Anyone who says all truth is subjective, that is a major truth claim. You're saying everybody else is wrong. You've become the one setting, setting down all the rules. And you're also saying Jesus who said in John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. You're saying he's wrong. Like, wow, you're talking about an exclusive claim. The writer of Hebrews would say Jesus has said this because he's not just God. Watch this. He's going to make a shift in chapter 2. He's better because he's man. He's the God man. That's why he's better than angels. He's better than any of us. He is the Savior. And as we've already sung today, we in our families, we all pass on certain values. Think about it. We pass on beliefs from generation to generation for good or bad. And what he's going to show us here in Hebrews 2, now verse 5 through 18 is where we'll be. He's going to show us that our new family, this better family, has a better culture to live in. Uh, and don't miss this. You are the one who determines culture within any organization, within your own family. We have a better sibling in Jesus. And we have a better inheritance. So first, a better family culture. The writer goes back to this uh, argument that, that Jesus is better than angels because they're obsessed with angels. But he says that God is going to raise us up even to surpass angels. Look at verse 5. For it is, it, it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. Now again, we need some, need some context here. Subjection means to, to put under control, under direction. Okay, He's saying, not to angels. He's going to make a point here. For, and then he says, I'm speaking about the age to come. This is the world to come. This is the, the new kingdom on a new earth. Okay, Resurrected people on a resurrected, redeemed earth, worshiping a resurrected Savior. Jesus ushered in the kingdom of God. So it is now advancing in the world. As he's going to show us through those who live for him and like him. And he's going to make the point by going to a beautiful passage in Psalm 8. Where he's quoting this, verse 6. It has been testified somewhere. I think that's interesting. Uh, somewhere, it says. I'm thinking, no, you know exactly where it is because you're quoting it. What is man that you are mindful of him? Of the son of man that you care for him? Now, it's important. Him means us. In fact, other translations say them. Mankind, okay? Humans, men and women, boys and girls. Which speaks, this, this Psalm 8 speaks of the dignity and honor of human beings. This is why he goes here. There's a better culture that we now live in, in the family of God, because it's permeated by God's love for us. It's a family of grace. And he says, God cares for us. 
This is what he's saying. Now, uh, some of us perhaps would think, well, of course he does. I mean, we're kind of awesome. I mean, I know we're at the top of all things created. And didn't he give us dominion over all things? And, you know, think about this. Um, not so awesome. I mean, we're, and for, what the writer's saying is we're just specks in the universe. Like tiny me? That's the whole point of the song. Us? You would have, bring your attention to us. And the Hebrew word in Psalm 8, and the whole, the kind of reference here is uh, the word cares is the word in Hebrew. It's visits. So he cares for us. How? By coming among us. We see this word throughout the Exodus narrative. He cares for his people. How? By showing up himself. All right. Which is again, okay, that's what we're going to see happen in Jesus. It'd be like me saying, I went uh, on a hospital visit. Went for a hospital visit, you know, this week. What does that mean? Well, I went and showed up in person, right? To care for, to pray for someone. Okay. In this case, Larry Bird, many of you know, who's doing, who's doing well, getting better and better, but to pray over him. Why? Because I wanted to be present, right? God shows up in your life and mine. He's present among us in this new family. We have a culture of care and love. Everyone is cared for by God and he's called us to do the same. Look at this. We also have dignity and honor in the family. Look at verse 7. You made him. Okay, it's important to remember. This is us, not Jesus. Not yet. You made us. He's man. Okay, it was the reference. For a little while lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor. He's saying we are, I mean, higher than all creation. He says for a little while, our trajectory, watch this, is higher than angels. Now you can say again, I'm not thinking much about comparing myself to angels. Angels are, are higher than us, you could say now, in terms of power, capability, service. But our trajectory is beyond them. But notice he's made us that way for a little while until the consummation of all things. In fact, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 3, uh, no verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 3, it says we're going to rule over angels somehow, how that works. But drawing from Psalm 8... He says, human beings are central to God's purpose and plan and we're given dignity and honor and glory by God created in his image. We have a role to play is what he's saying here. We have a clear purpose in, how about this, in the family business. He's called us in. Look at verse 8 continues. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, okay, under our control, direction, he left nothing outside his control. God's left nothing outside of our control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjecting to him. See, the writer of Hebrews is saying what we all know. It doesn't look like we're really under control of much. But let's parse this out a little bit. When we look at the creation narrative, he's drawing back to how, why would you create man? Why would you even look at us? And out of the creation narrative, we have in chapter 1 and 2 of Genesis... God gives us our mandate to care for, to be co-regents, to be co-laborers with him, even co-creators. He says, you're going to be over all the fish in the sea, over all the, the birds in the sky and, and all the animals. And man is going to be over all things, co-creators with God. We're going to be fruitful and multiply, but even more, we're going to create art and beauty and music and cities and, and, and gardens and and all the things that God has called us to and beautiful relationships and families and churches we're going to be stewards over all of this cooperating with God and we, with each other he places us as co-workers look at this, Adam and Eve, us in the garden now the whole world becomes our garden God gives us all we need to worship him we're reigning and ruling over all things and yet, it doesn't look like things are happening like that. He says, not yet. But this is the kingdom that has come and how we're to live. Because we don't always care. Think about your own family or relationship. We don't always care for one another as we should. We don't always uh, honor one another with dignity and, and glory. We, we don't always honor others as created in the image of God. We, we don't. 
do this so well. We don't always find our role as co-laborers with God and God as our guide. We, wh- why? Because, well, after Genesis 1 and 2 comes Genesis 3. And so we were fallen people. We, we would rather serve ourselves. We'd rather steward everything around us for us and not for others. And yet God, in Christ, gives us the power to live differently in the world. This is how his kingdom comes. No, it says at present. Okay, currently, it doesn't look like the kingdom is coming. Now, let me say this parenthetically. I I talk to a lot of Christians these days who are just kind of freaking out over what's happening in the world. As if it's new. And, And granted, there's a lot that's happening in our nation these days but we don't need to freak out because we see the trajectory we know where we're heading and we see some some something wow the gospel doesn't seem to be advancing in the world like like we really desire to depends on where you are in the world some of you were with us this week i saw the gospel advancing all week long among our children kids connected with kids you're a kid i'm a kid we're best friends now we're now we're best friends now That's all families coming and and children receiving Christ. On uh, on Monday, I heard of of AJ who who came to faith in Jesus at our sports camp on Monday afternoon. He's shown up at VBS and he's, I'm I'm ready for this, long conversation with him about what it means to follow Jesus. That happened over and over again. I saw the kingdom advance this week. See, here's my point. The reason we don't think the kingdom is advancing is because of the way we think that it will advance. We're not looking with kingdom eyes. And this is what the writer of Hebrews is saying. To these new Christians who are under persecution, he's saying, hang on. And the kingdom is advancing, though you cannot see it. Remember what Jesus said. Jesus said the kingdom will not come through worldly power. It will not come through dominance or force, violence. It will come instead. How does the kingdom come? You look at the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, the Kingdom Manifesto. He says it's going to come through people who are merciful, who are poor in spirit, who are humble, who who are kind and loving. He lays it out for us, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. That's how the kingdom advances. And too often we've adopted the world's way that says it's going to come through power. It's going to come through dominance. It's going to come when we're louder and stronger and more powerful than everybody else. And Jesus says, and shows us, that's not how it comes. And this blows our minds. Again, it's N.T. Wright who talks about so well the inauguration of the kingdom and how Christ became king, one of his great books. But he, he notes this, God taking charge will not come by human force and power. It will, it will be by, he says it won't be by sending in tanks and guns. It'll be by sending in the merciful, the poor in spirit, the humble, the loving people of God. And he says by the time the people with all the guns and tanks figure out what's going on, the meek and the merciful have already set up orphanages for kids who've been displaced and, and, and care for people who need food And and those who are poor are finding shelter and those who are isolated find family. That's how the kingdom comes. And even this week, through our giving, I was hearing stories from our Baptist World Alliance who are involved in ministries there that we've given directly to in Ukraine and just outside of Ukraine, Poland and other places where that is exactly what's happening. That's how the kingdom advances. When it doesn't look like it is, it is. And The writer of Hebrews says to us today, don't be discouraged because it's happening and it can happen through your life as you live in this new family. It is now taking shape what God has called us to do. And even as our kids learned this week from all of our different mission partners around the city, as Keith noted, they gave more than $4,500. And some of y'all are like, their parents gave $4,500. No. No, I talked to several kids, parents who told me they saved up like for months for something else. They gave all of it. Like kids with amazing stories of generosity. That's how the kingdom comes. Through an over, overflowing generosity. And can I say it right now, currently, we're behind on our budget here. 
in a big way, moving into an intensive season. And, and, and if you could give love and beyond, you can do so now and it would be helpful as we've noted already. But here's the point. Isn't this the kind of family you want to live in? Verse 6, 1, where everybody cares for each other. In verse 7, we, 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 we honor each other with dignity. And we, 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 we have a divine role to play in verse 8. This is the kind of, kind of family you want to live in. Think about your own family. Every problem in your family, your staff team, your extended family, every problem is because we don't live like this. We don't care for one another. We, should. we don't honor each other with dignity. We, we, we don't have a role to play that's significant, perhaps. We don't flourish. So this is the upside down kingdom. And Jesus is the pioneer. Don't miss this. This is what the writer will say over and over again. You want to know what this looks like? This life? Look at Jesus. Be furiously obsessed with him and live like him. Because in him, we have a better sibling in the family. Look at this. We, we, we don't see things. I, I love that. Here's the shift. Watch this. We don't yet see everything as God intended. But look at verse 9. What does it say? But we see him. But we see him. Who for a little while was made lower than the angels. What does that mean? Well, he became a, a man. Namely, Jesus crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. He becomes the substitute for us. He becomes the God-man. Why? So that he could live the life and die on the cross. Look at this. Death defeats death. It's the only way that it could happen. Substitutionary death. And he's going to end up much higher much brighter glory than any angel or anyone else. He died once and for all is how he'll put it later. This is why the gospel, listen, somebody even need to hear this. The gospel is not good advice. It's good news. Good advice says you must do this, this, and this. News is something that we hear that has already happened on our behalf. And the writer of Hebrews says, hey, it's by grace that you've been saved through faith because Jesus has died the death that should have been ours. And by saying tasted death, he's saying he took it all in because death is the final um, reality for us. We can't beat death. None of us. It, it, it is the pinnacle of human frailty, human fragility, human frustration. All of us will die. Jesus comes, the only one, he defeats death so that we can follow him in resurrection as well. Look at verse 10. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist. Sounds like Colossians 1.16. You might have caught that. For everything was created by him, for him, through him, and to him. All things have been created in bringing many sons and daughters to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Now, no, he's not saying Jesus becomes perfect through suffering. Our salvation come, becomes perfect through his suffering. Jesus becomes the founder. You catch that? The word is archetype, literally. The pioneer, the pathfinder, the way maker. He's the first one. In Romans 8, 29, it says be, that we might be conformed into the image of his son. Listen to this. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. He's the first installment. He's the new human. He's the new Adam. We then follow him, live like him. That's how the kingdom advances. In the Beatitudes, he's describing the kind of people through which the kingdom comes. Not simply a new ethic, like, hey, try harder, work harder, and be like this. No, it's through the meek, the merciful. And then it says that he's, our salvation is made perfect. The word there is teleos, complete. You might know to telestai, it's a verb form, or a form of that. Uh, it's finished. And Jesus said it on the cross, everything is completed. Now we can be made holy by him. And you know this is true. It's through our own suffering, like Jesus that we become 
sanctified and holy. Look at verse 11. For he who sanctifies and those who sanctified all have one source from the same stock, literally is what it says. This is why he is not ashamed to call us brothers. Now this is an amazing thing. He's not, a, he's not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. But look at this. Our family resemblance with Jesus, our brother, comes primarily through suffering. And we all know this. Because it's through suffering that our idols are stripped, that our strength is stripped away, and we are brought before him, humble and ready then to be transformed, to be made holy, is what sanctification is. Sanctification is glory begun. And glory is sanctification completed, is how F.F. Bruce put it. That's our trajectory. So think about this. This can be tender for some of us. Some of us might be ashamed of certain members of our family. Maybe we're the ones that have brought shame on our families in various ways. And in a, an honor-shame culture, particularly in the ancient uh, world, this is, this is devastating. And think about that. This is what the writer's saying. Us, sinners, Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. That's an amazing thing. He's not ashamed. And so he goes to a passage in Psalm 22 and in Isaiah 8 saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. These passages are both about God identifying, not being ashamed, his willingness to come among his people. To condescend to us in this new culture, this family. We have a new culture. We have a new sibling. And we'll close with this. We have a better inheritance. And I want you to think about this. This, not even after we die, not death, but life. Look at verse 14. Since therefore, another therefore, all of this, the children share in flesh and blood. He himself likewise partook of the same things. He becomes flesh and blood that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death that is the devil Jesus defeats death in our inheritance is life look at verse 15 and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery now he said it in verse 9 we do not listen we do not fear death the Christian does not fear death ever Dying, maybe. Death, never. Because the best is yet to come. Always yet to come. Our inheritance, look at this, is life. It is not bondage. It's not slavery. Our inheritance is ultimate freedom in Christ and power. Look at this. Victory to overcome sin. Look at verse 16. For surely it is not angels that he helps. Now you see he's concluding his argument. It's not angels. But he helps the offspring of Abraham. What does he mean here? Now, if you know anything, and they would have known the Old Testament. Wait, Abraham was reckoned righteous by faith. Now we place our faith in Christ. We're the ones who now receive the promised inheritance. The promised land, literally the new earth, heaven, but also in the here and now. We've received an inheritance. Therefore, verse 17, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation this is to an atoning sacrifice the wrath satisfier for sins of the people Jesus the better high priest himself becomes the sacrifice this would have been mind blowing as it is to us but watch this we receive his presence and he empathizes with us. Verse 18, for because he himself has suffered when tempted, even as we read earlier out of Hebrews 4, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus empathizes with us. Friends, listen, you don't have to live in sin anymore. You can, you've, if you receive Christ, you have power, victory over sin. And, and, and now as we close our time together, we're going to do something different today. We've, we've, we've left some time for response. And, and I want you to think about all that you have heard. He's invited you into this family. A family of grace. In fact, how about this? 
all of us have a trust fund of grace. Every one of us, a trust fund of inheritance, of God blessing us with treasure. He is giving us His own Son. He's given us a place to live and to find glory and dignity in Him, a place to serve, a a role in the kingdom. He's given us siblings who are growing to look like the ultimate sibling, Jesus, our big brother. He's given us an inheritance together, a victory, a power, an inheritance that, 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 that we will all then go forth into the world and tell others about Jesus. Come join our family. And today what we want to do, we thought it'd be a great day for us to, to bless you and to pray over you. And I'm going to encourage you. This is something we don't do every week. But we're going to ask you literally, if you feel led, to come. To come to the front. I'll be here at the front. Keith, Jack Martin, Megan Hendrickson will be here at the front. We're here to, to pray over you. And, and here's how I want to parse this out. Coming forward, I know often it's like, well, everybody's going to think my life's in a wreck. It might be, but no. We're saying we want to bless you. Some of you need to come and join this family. There's a place for you here. Some of you don't have family for different reasons. We want to pray a blessing over you. Maybe as a couple, as a family, you want to come and pray. You can just come to the front and pray with one of us. Or just come and pray before the Lord. Lord, we commit ourselves anew to you. But friends, if you want to come and have us pray over you today, we would be honored to do so as priests among us, bridge builders to God. Sometimes we don't know how to pray for ourselves. And we want to pray for you. And so if if the Lord's leading you to come before the throne of God above, we're welcome. And there's a spot for you. There's a place for you. So you come as we devote ourselves to him. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to uh, have a time of response. Lord, we thank you that you welcome us into your family. You've provided this beautiful culture within our family of dignity and honor, a role to play. You are our better sibling, showing us the way. Thank you that you're not ashamed of us, that you come among us and welcome us. And we thank you that we have a better inheritance, an inheritance of victory, of life, and eternity. And Lord, we respond to you now. Before we head off and rush into a week, we pause to come before you. Thank you, Jesus, that we can come to your throne. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.